Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our today's uh, online meetup. So uh, usually Aksana moderates uh, the meetups, um, but she will absent. She will be absent the upcoming months. So um, I take over uh, her responsibility uh, in the orga and in the moderating <clears throat> for a while. So my name is Anya, and it's my pleasure to be here. And um, I would say uh, I'm a kind of newbie uh, in moderating online meetups. So please be patient. <laughs> with me um okay like every time um yeah we would like to thank uh our sponsors source labs uh to amusement and uh trendic and uh they are always helping us to organize the meetup and uh paying the fees and uh promoting the event and the special thanks go out to severin and uh, aurelian who uh, supports us uh, wherever they can. And um, yeah, I got a, a lot of support from them. Um, so thanks, guys. And um, yeah, if you missed the, the previous meetups, um, you can just go to our website, continuoustestingmeetup.com, and there you will find the recordings of the previous meetups. Um, so now let's uh, start with our today's uh, speaker, Thomas. <clears throat> Thomas is located in Liverpool and uh, he works as a head of test capability uh, at Global Logic. And he will talk about the art of uh, persuasion for testers. So um, to all participants, um, as always, please mute yourself um, if you have burning questions and then please post them in, in the chat or uh, in our Slack channel. And um, otherwise, please wait uh, until our Q&A session right after um, Thomas' talk. So um, Thomas, um, I uh, stop sharing my screen and um, would hand over to you. So um, the stage is yours. Have fun. Perfect. Thank you very much. Cheers. Right, let me uh, figure out how to use technology and go over there, share the screen. Right, cool. Hopefully you can all see my screen. Give me a nod, I'll just look over there. Perfect, thank you very much. So thank you all for taking the time to join tonight's session. Uh, where well, I'm going to be talking about persuasion, a skill that I think a lot of us struggle with in the QA community, but one that is absolutely vital to develop because all our ideas that we might have to improve quality on our projects, well, we need support in order to implement them, or at least most of them. So I'm going to give you some tips and maybe a structured approach that you can use to be more influential in your teams. But first, a little bit about me very briefly. My name's Thomas Shipley. Um, I share ideas at my website, tomdriven.dev. I also occasionally, but very rarely tweet at tomdriven.dev. But if you have any questions after the session, you're like me, you forget to ask and you think about them late at night, that's where you can send them. And I work, as said, at Global Logic as a head of the test practice or something like that. So let's move into it. And I want to start with three ideas, and let's just hit that. Um, three ideas that I think are really powerful when used to persuade others. The first is that people want help with their problems. I want help with my problems, you probably want help with your problems. We can take advantage of that when we look to persuade people. The second is we often share the same problems. It's very rare that the problem you're having is only experienced by you. The chances are someone else is experiencing that problem as well. And so we can think about how our problems might relate to other people's problems and how they might actually be a shared problem. And then finally, we can solve problems without permission. We don't necessarily even need to persuade anybody. Occasionally, we can just go ahead, get the thing done and move on. So they're the three ideas that I'm gonna talk about throughout the whole of tonight's session. So let's start with a true story based on my many failed attempts of persuasion, which has helped me refine my technique and have some success. And so tonight's session is going to be a story because I think stories are the best way to explain things. So here's the characters in my story. I have Bob, the QA, 
who looks suspiciously like me and I changed the name because it was really confusing when I tried to do this practicing at home. So Bob the QA, Sue the developer, Ivy the business analyst, and Zoe the project manager. And the, this forms our team, it's a small project engineering team, and they work on API stuff. And Bob goes to Sue asking for some help with performance tests. He's got an issue with the performance tests, it's a code problem, he's struggling. And so he asks Sue as the developer if he can get some help. And she says that she's busy right now and unfortunately she can't help, she's not got the time, which is something I think we've probably all experienced. So Bob says, oh, okay, fine, um, I'll see you later. So I can't see the chat, but how many of you have experienced this before? If you just want to drop into the chat and I'll try and use it, there we go. If anyone's experienced this before, go ahead and drop into the chat or make a reaction, wave at the camera. I'm sure that you've all probably experienced something like this before. This is something that is really very common for QAs, particularly working on busy product engineering teams. And so I'd like to learn from this story a little bit. What is it that we can do and advise Bob to make him more persuasive when trying to get help? So first, a question for you just to think about. What motivated you to come to this talk today? Why were you interested in spending some of your evening listening to me online, sat at home? And the chances are, I believe, it's because you want help with your problem. You may have lots of different types of problem. It might not be the same problem. Maybe your manager doesn't support you in your experiments or the team won't contribute to testing or you, people aren't listening to your ideas. Or maybe you're just locked out of your Netflix account and you couldn't think of anything better to do. So you probably want help with a problem. And I know that. And I used it to persuade you to attend this session today. So let's take a quick look at the abstract for this talk. So if you look at all the words in purple, I've bolded out the bits and I've minimized the bits which are really filler, but it's all about you. It all talks about you, the people you work with, the new ideas you are bursting to try. I want to help you develop your style, show the potential of your idea. You, you, you. I don't talk about the problems I've experienced in the past with persuasion. I talk about the problems you're probably experiencing and how I want to help you with them. So this for me is the foundation of good persuasion. The fact that it is easier to help someone, it's easier to persuade someone to let you help them than it is persuade them to help you. It's far easier to offer help. And Sue probably needs help as well. She probably has things that she's struggling with. So the trick for me for, to persuade others is to frame your problem so it's another person's problem to the other person, the person you're looking to persuade. So for Bob, the problem he's got with his performance testing code, what is it maybe that Stu is experiencing, which might be a shared problem they have in common, and that will make for a much more persuasive discussion. And again, this is something I know, and I employed it in the abstract for this talk. So all those words in purple, they're talking about you, the problems you're experiencing. And then at the end, I shift it, and I say that it's our problem. We're in it together, which is far more persuasive to talk about how we're in it together, we can solve it together. So I say things like, we are not let down by our idea. Persuading others is our downfall. We don't talk. Let us change that. How we as a community combine that with your great idea, you will be unstoppable. That's far more persuasive than just saying, I've learned some stuff. I'd like to share it. So now that we have thought a little bit about persuasion and some of the tricks that we might be able to use, how can we put that together in a more structured approach? So for me, when thinking about persuasion, I think one of the easy ways to think about it is the three Ps. Personality, your style. How do you approach persuading others? How do you present your ideas? People, your target. What is their problem, whether that's one person or many people? And how can you potentially help them with it? And your plan, your approach. Do you actually have a deliberate plan? Have you sat down and thought about how you will approach this person or group of people and show and demonstrate to them that you can help them with their problems? So let's start with personality. What makes a persuasive personality? So for me, a persuasive personality is one that's balanced. It encourages people to want to even talk to you in the first place. 
So when Bob is looking to persuade Sue, he should try and have a balanced personality. And by balanced, what I mean is he needs to control the way he acts when persuading others and also try and hopefully be seen in a certain way, be perceived in a certain way. So let's start with how we act. Bob, when persuading Sue, should try to be positive. And that's for two reasons. The first is she, he should really believe in his idea and what he's hoping to persuade Sue about, the help he needs. If he doesn't believe in it or he doesn't think it won't, it won't work, that's the sort of thing that people pick up on. And it's going to damage the relationship as he goes to persuade. The second reason is kind of simple. We as people like to be around other positive people. Now, that doesn't mean being happy and smiley all the time, but it does mean trying to perhaps take control of the occasional cynicism that we all have. Because we are all attracted to positive people, so that's going to make the conversation easier. The second thing that Bob should try to do in the way he acts is ask questions and actively listen to the response. Asking questions with the intent to understand, not just to reply. And he should do that for, again, two reasons. The first reason is he will gather information about what Sue thinks, about what he's trying to persuade her of. Is it good? Is it bad? Any concerns she has? And he can use that information to, be, to adjust his approach. The second reason, again, is quite simplistic. We all like to feel listened to. And so if you properly listen to someone, that will help develop your relationship with them. And that will help build some trust which is really helpful when looking to persuade others. And then finally, persistence. It is rare that you will persuade someone of something in one conversation. It can happen, but usually persuasion takes time. So don't be too put off if in your first attempt, it doesn't go exactly as planned. That's probably to be expected. And then how do we want to be perceived? How would we like Sue to see Bob when he's hoping to persuade her or something? Well, firstly, as a team player, if Bob comes across as someone who's only interested in himself and is not interested in the team and supporting the team, then that's going to be picked up on and it might make Sue less interested in what he's got to say. So we have to come across as genuinely interested, not just in helping ourselves, but the team as a whole. The second that I've already talked about a little bit is trustworthiness. So if Bob has a reputation of not doing what he says he's going to do when he says he's going to do it, well, that might make Sue less interested in talking to him. Maybe that's because he's let her down in the past, or maybe it's because, as is often the case when solving problems, there's shared tasks across the team. And if Bob has a reputation for not doing his bit, then she's going to be less interested in hearing his ideas. So you want to be seen as trustworthy. And then finally, being credible. Incredible is really hard to define, but Bob wants to be seen credible in himself, but also in his idea. His idea needs to come across as credible. And as I say, that one's really hard. So I'm going to talk a little bit about one way that you can demonstrate your credibility. And that's with power. So there's this piece of research from French and Raven called the basis of power. And you can use it as the basis of your credibility when trying to persuade others. Now, there's six bases that I they identified. So let's start at the top, coercion. Don't use this. If you're looking to persuade people, don't coerce them. But it can work. I'm sure we've all had to do some mandatory training at some point in our careers, maybe on some legislation or some HR thing. And the HR team tell you, if you don't do it by a certain date, you'll get a written warning or something like that. That's coercion. And it works, but at best you get some compliance. People don't truly believe in your idea. Now, the opposite of coercion is reward. And you should use reward. And remember, reward doesn't have to be a big thing. It can just be showing gratitude. But again, reward will only get you so far. People won't truly believe in your idea, but they'll want to help you because you tend to be nice to them. So then we move on to the other four, which can be more powerful. So there's legitimate power, your position. If you are the head of a team, you're the lead, or you're seen in that role, you're perceived that way, then you may be able to inspire people and inspire them to really believe in your idea. And that can be very helpful when persuading others. But of course, be careful of relying on legitimate power too much because you can lose it. 
you might not be the lead in your next team. And so try not to rely on it completely, but it is a useful source of power that you can use when persuading others to demonstrate your credibility. Then there's expert power. We can all be experts. So whether you're a junior member of the team or the most senior member of the team, it doesn't matter. For example, you might be the junior member of the team, but you do all the testing of the UI and you know that UI inside and out. You really thoroughly understand the product. That makes you an expert in that product. And that will help people trust you and your ideas when talking about the product and what you might want to do to help improve quality. The next one is really simplistic, but it's just human nature. It's referent power. The fact that you're liked. If people like you, they want to help you. Maybe it shouldn't be that way, but that's human nature. We want to help people we like. And then finally, informational power. It's the old saying that information is power. If you have access to information that the person you're looking to persuade doesn't have, then you can carefully and sensitively potentially use that information to help sway their decision. decision. So now that we understand a bit more about our personality and how we can perhaps present ourselves in a more persuasive way, let's talk about people, the people that we're looking to target to persuade. So as I said before, we probably want to look at shared problems over talking about our own. So when Bob is looking to persuade Sue to get some help with this performance test code, he needs to think about what are the problems that Sue has. And it just so happens, because this is my story and I'm making it up, that Bob heard at the stand-up that Sue has an issue with a, a performance bug and she's really struggling to solve it. So rather than going to Sue and saying, can you help me with my performance test code, he should focus in the middle gathering performance test data, because gathering performance test data will help Sue in solving her issue. And it will also help Bob because to gather that data, he needs to fix the code. So these two people can help each other and they both get what they want. So try and focus in the middle where you can. And then once you've identified your shared problem, look in your organization, in your team for people who might help. And you can use this matrix to help you identify what you should do with the different types of people you see in your team. So in this team, for example, if we run down it, we have the problematic. So we have no problematic people in this team, but these people are people with a lot of influence over the person we're looking to persuade, but not a lot of interest. And you have to keep them updated and resolve any concerns they might have. Because if they decide they don't like your idea, but they're not particularly interested, they might just mention a throwaway comment to the person you're looking to persuade. And that's going to make your life really difficult. So try and satisfy their needs. Then if we move down in influence, but also down in interest, we have indifferent. So Ivy on the team turns out she's indifferent to this problem. She sees it as a dev and test problem. She's got other work to do. She's not too bothered. So for these people, we want to monitor them and just anticipate any needs they might have, send them some general updates if we need to. So let's move across in interest to supporters. So supporters are people with not so much, so much in, uh, influence, but they're quite interested in your idea and they want to help. So we should let them know about what we're doing and keep them updated and take advantage of that interest and get their feedback on our idea and how it might be improved because they really want to help us. And then finally, when we move up to move up in influence again and people who are still interested, we have Zoe, the project manager. So Zoe is what you might call a promoter, someone who has a lot of influence over Sue and also is really interested in solving the problem. So we should engage with Zoe and work closely on solving it because it turns out Zoe's getting a lot of pressure to solve this performance issue in the team from the rest of the organisation. So she wants to support and do everything she can. So that's how you might categorise and manage the different relationships that can support you in persuading somebody else. And then finally, we might want to think just briefly about some of the reasons that Sue might resist persuasion. Now, there's lots of different reasons, and it's probably a whole talk in itself. But for now, I'd just like to focus on four. So Sue might just have some fear about ideas or helping for whatever reason. And so Bob should probably try and find out what causes this fear, asking questions and actively listening to the response. And then once he understands what those fears are, he might go to Zoe the project manager, and get her to help him 
in solving and resolving these fears. The second is a loss of control. A lot of the time when people try and persuade others, they try and basically dictate to them and tell them this is the way we have to do it. It's the only way. That's rarely the case, particularly in technology. So to help people feel like they've still got control, and in fact, they're part of solving the problem and they're not just being dictated to, give them a choice. Ideally, when you're looking to persuade someone, try and give them a couple of options and let them pick. It helps them feel part of the solution and it makes them feel like they're more likely to say yes. Then there's comfort, good enough. You've probably all seen this before. You're working in a team and they say, well, the performed test code is not great, but it kind of works. So, you know, we've got bigger problems. In that case, try and come up with a proof of concept. Bob should be trying to come up with an example that he can show because it helps people get past that psychological barrier of taking the first step when they don't necessarily know what that step is. And maybe Zoe can help him by get, putting him in touch with another QA and another team and they can work together. And then finally, personal reasons. Unfortunately, sometimes someone just doesn't like you and there's nothing you can do about it. So in the short term, you might get someone else to persuade Sue, Bob might. So he might say to Zoe, Sue doesn't like me very much. Can you have a, a word with her and present the ideas as your own? And that might be a more effective result. And in the long term, Bob might just reflect on maybe his own behaviour and why Sue might not like him. And there may be nothing he can do, but there might also be other things. Maybe he doesn't actively listen. So now that we know about personality and how we present ideas and the people that we're looking to persuade and what the different elements are in that, let's try and bring it together into a plan. So Bob's going to change his approach because he's been listening to me talk and he's going to try something a bit different. So he's identified his sources of credibility. He is an expert. He knows everything there is to know about quality and that helps people in the team listen to him. He also has a bit of information because he's been talking to Zoe and he knows that Zoe's getting pressure from the rest of the organization to solve the performance issues within her team, within the API that they're working on. So he's got that little bit of information that Sue doesn't know about. And he's identified the shared problem. He knows from listening at Stand Up that Sue is working on a performance bug and gathering performance data would help with that. And that would also help him fix his test. And then finally, he's identified that promoter, Zoe, someone who has lots of influence over, Zoo, over Sue and someone who is really interested in helping Bob solve this problem. And so he can bring it together. So instead of going to Sue and saying, help me with my problem, he can say, I heard that you were working on a performance bug at Stand Up. Maybe some more data would help. And Sue agrees. And then Bob can say, well, I would love to get you some more data, but I'm struggling with performance tests. And Zoe is under a lot of pressure to get this performance bug solved. Maybe you could help me because, you know, you're a developer, you're much better at coding than me, and I'm sure you'll pick up on the issue very quickly. Because, of course, flattery is another skill that we can use when trying to persuade people. And Sue is more open to this as a result. It's a shared problem that she's interested in and she knows Zoe is struggling and she's influenced by Zoe. And so, yeah, she offers her help. So it's a much more persuasive argument. But as much as I think this is a good approach to persuading people, it still won't always work. And so the secret of persuasion is the easiest way to persuade people is just not to bother just solve the problem and move on. And so there's a great quote here from Rear Admiral Grace Hopper where she says, if it's a good idea, go ahead and do it. It is much easier to apologize than it is to get permission, which is a brilliant quote. And also, if you don't know who she is, you should definitely Google her. Among her many achievements, she's the person that came up with the term we all use as QAs, the bug. She was the one that popularized that term. So you should definitely Google her. And so here's my four step plan that I use to try and get things done without permission. Um, and hopefully no one I work with is actually on the call because they'll know and that will be a problem. So the four step plan, I start off with step one and I talk to people about my idea, the thing that I want to achieve. And I ask questions of people. Do they think it's a good idea? How could it be improved? And so on. And I try to identify promoters and supporters, people who will work with me in implementing this idea. 
And you can move to step two without that, but of course the chances of succeeding drop a little bit. So you move to step two, you create a proof of concept, a small proof of concept that helps demonstrate your idea, but importantly also helps people get past that psychological barrier of taking the first step of understanding where to begin because you've already begun for them. Once you've got that, start showcasing it to everybody. If you've got lunch and learn sessions or informal sessions within your organization, get the opportunity to get in front of people and show them your idea, whether that's a presentation, whether that's just a demo, doesn't matter. Try and build some support. And then finally, this is when you seek permission. In step four, that's when you seek the sign off you need, the permission you're after. Because now you can talk to the person you're looking to persuade and talk to them about an idea that already has momentum. It's far harder to dismiss an idea that has people behind it, has demonstrated value and interest that has momentum rather than an idea that you've not actually proved. And you might fail when doing this. Solving things without permission doesn't always work. But even if you fail, you will learn a lot from doing it. You'll improve your critical analysis skills, your technical skills, probably your presentation skills, managing expectations, and so on. There's a lot to be learned from just trying to do something to solve a problem and build support. And, you know, if all else fails, you can definitely just seek forgiveness. So to wrap up, People want help with their problems. So when looking to persuade others, showcase what you can do to help them. It's far more persuasive when you talk about their problems rather than your own. And we often share the same problems. So look for overlap and frame your problem so it's theirs too. And finally, you can solve problems without permission. You don't always need someone to say, yes, go ahead. If you think it's a good idea, then just go ahead and do it. You will absolutely learn a lot either way. Because your ideas will improve quality. You are all experts in quality. You're all here today to learn from your community. You have great ideas. Please use these techniques to amplify them within your teams. And with that, any questions? I'll look over here. And I have no idea what time I did that in either because my time had disappeared, which is a shame. Pretty much half an hour. Yes! Maybe 25, <laughs> 25 minutes, something like that. Yeah. Oh, that'll do. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, if nobody's asking anything, do you have any examples where um, your uh, persuasion tactic failed? So while maybe while you were still working on it uh, or how you got from failing at persuasion to getting better at it, maybe something like that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think actually persuasion isn't where I started. So I probably started more with frustration. So I want to do things, I can see opportunities, and for whatever reason, the people I'm working with aren't listening to me. And I don't know that they're more interested in their problems because I hadn't thought about it in any depth. And actually my journey to becoming a bit better at persuading others, and it is a journey that you continually, it's a skill you like develop like anybody else, is the advice that I was given, that quote, that it's easier to solve the problem than get permission. And I think starting there helps develop your persuasive skills because part of doing that is sitting down with your team and showing them the stuff you're working on and talking to them about it, getting their feedback and going through that process, you naturally start to develop a sense for what is more persuasive and what's not. Great, thank you. No worries. If you have a question, feel free to ask in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask straight away. Yeah, please do. Happy to ask any answer any questions that you might have. Um, hi, Thomas. Thanks uh, a bunch for uh, for this presentation and 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 the talk. Um, I just like to bring um, one point to the picture that often um, often when we 
SQAs really want to or need to persuade, let it be product, devs, um, any entity in the team. Mm -hmm. um, there always comes the trait of um, the priority at hand. And at most times, I mean, when you really have all the facts and you really prepared yourself, again, you might really get, uh, you know, uh, debriefed uh, with the idea that hey, really understand the consequences of uh, of of an observation or the issue you po pointed out, but uh, in terms of priority, this is really um, this is really not something we should dive into all hands right at this moment. We might want to reiterate over this later, mm -hmm. but often you really want to advocate your issues. Yes. Because I mean, collectively, it can stand out as a as a significant issue. So, without facts, I mean, of course, you will have your facts to back up your uh, point. But how do you address when uh, when people bring the priority flag, and and then you really have to struggle for, you know, for your topic or for your observation. Yeah, it's a really great question. Thank you. Um, so it's actually something that I talk about in a blog post on my website where some of this stuff originally came from. Um, but I just don't have time to cover it all, unfortunately, because I'm trying to keep it under half an hour. Uh, so it's often the case, and I've experienced it, say you're working with a delivery lead, they are concerned most about delivery. That's their job. And you, as a QA, are concerned most with quality. And those two things don't always line up um, because maybe the delivery lead wants to just get something out quite quickly, whereas you're really concerned that the quality isn't there or there's something better you can do. So for me, in those situations, I would look to experiment. That's the way I would frame it. So in most organizations, yes, you're going to be busy, you're going to be stretched, but you can perhaps find a little bit of time in your day to experiment with some code or experiment with an exploratory testing technique or so on, and use that experimental time to come up with that proof of concept, to come up with something that might work. And then when you go to the delivery lead in the future, rather than it being an argument about it's not a priority, we've not got the time, you can say, well, yeah, I understand that. We've not got the time as a whole team to do it, but I've spent a little bit of time that I had spare or however you want to frame it. You know, I spent some time in the evening if you wanted to tell a white lie. Um, and I've come up with this proof of concept that I think demonstrates the idea. And it's something that we could quite quickly productionize. What do you think? And so it comes back to really this approach that I've used in the past, because I've definitely been in that situation where I've been told it's not a priority. And so you have to get a bit sneaky and say, right, I'm going to carve out a little bit of time in my day to experiment, I'm going to find others who might experiment with me and build some momentum under the covers and then eventually demonstrate that to the person who says it's not a priority. Yeah, I can I can I can relate to that. Actually, I would definitely <laughs> agree with that as well. I mean, that's the last resort. Uh, like I would say everyone might be looking for I mean, to back up your theory and also to 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 point out uh, the the consequences of what you think is potentially uh, significant. Mm, yeah, thanks. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Any other questions? I say happy to answer them. Or if you've got some situation in work where you're not sure how to proceed, you're not sure how to persuade people. I'm happy to give you my opinion for what it's worth. It might not help, but I can certainly give it. Oh, here we go. So what would you suggest when you're trying to persuade a team to make process improvements? The proof of concept isn't really suitable. Yeah, that's a hard one. Um, and it's one that I've come across quite a few times. So one of my previous talks that you may have seen if you've come to one of the CTM events before, is called Ready for Test, a Symptom of a Poor Quality Culture. That whole talk came out of wanting to change the process internally from having a ready for test column that was just a bottleneck, which everyone just dumped their stuff in and no one really cared, to having whole team quality ownership. 
So when I spoke earlier about how if I go um, to sort of your personality, I can find it in here. Um, yeah, so let's move on. So when I talked about personality, I think in those situations, it's really important to be persistent and ask those questions and actively listen to the response. When you're trying to change process in organizations, that really does take time. And you have to look at what are the small wins that you can have. So say, for example, with wanting to get rid of that ready for test column, which is what I wanted to do. Well, to do that, I need to increase confidence in the team and that the quality is high enough to give it a go. And so part of it was making sure that I was just working more closely with the developers, that we were following you know, good practices of getting together ahead of work and thinking about it and what the quality issues might be and solving them up front and so on, and demonstrating that quality is improving to the point where, why do we even need this column anymore? I've made it redundant. So stuff like that can help. But yes, it is tricky um, when trying to change an organization and their process, and you won't always succeed, but try to be positive, be persistent, it's gonna take time, and yeah, ask those questions and really listen to the response because it might give you nuggets of information that you can use to help inform your approach, such as increasing the confidence in quality so you make the thing redundant. Um, also, maybe to add to that, um, it's usually possible to give a new process a try if you have, a, um, for example, a change in workflow. Just do it with one specific task and then collect some feedback afterwards. And depending on how people react, you might want to expand it or adjust it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. You, you can have not necessarily a proof of concept, but you can have a trial and they're kind of similar things. So yeah, you can definitely do something like that. That's a good, good piece of advice. Any other questions or problems that people are struggling with with their teams? My wife is downstairs making food, so I'm off the hook for making dinner tonight so I can stay longer if needed. Yeah, use this chance and bond exactly. your questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I say she's making dinner. She's using the pasta sauce that I made last night and putting it over pasta. But that's still dinner, and I still appreciate it. So, Also teamwork. Yeah? Mm. <laughs> exactly, teamwork, very important. Oh, there's another one. Oh, okay, cool. Um, what would you say about persuading by trying to use rationally thought out logic as a program logical. Don't even bother. <laughs> um, so logic is a poor way to persuade people, unfortunately, because people are not machines, they're not logical, they have emotions, they have agendas and so on. And so you can certainly, maybe don't bother too strong. You can certainly incorporate an element of logic, which is why I talk about things like proof of concepts and talking to people internally and finding supporters and so on. But I think actually part of being more persuasive is recognizing that you're working with people and people have, as I say, emotions, agendas, there's politics at play at times. And so you need to leverage everything you can. And logic is simply one part of the equation. So whether that's recognizing your promoters or your supporters, perhaps, um, and who might help you on the team with persuading others, or any of the other things we've talked about, like shared problems and your sources of power. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, that was my feeling too. I was just wanting to double check whether it's a uh, it's an avenue I should push. <laughs> Cheers. No, it's a it's a great question, and sometimes it can be helpful. For example, to gather data. So if someone says, "Oh, the quality your team delivers is really bad," well have a look internally about people who have influence over that individual and then give them the data that proves that they're wrong. So instead of you doing it, for example, with this team, if someone came up to Zoe and said that quality of delivery is awful in this team, rather than me as the QA try and convince that person, I'd give Zoe all the ammo she needs, all the data, and then she'd have the conversation.
Thanks. Cool, no worries. And um, there's another question. How to manage persuasion of teams that are not part of the same company? Let's say we are the testing supplier. Yeah, that's quite hard. So um, I, like a few of you on the call, I'm a consultant. That's my day job, um, as well as being sort of like head of test. Um, that can be difficult. And part of that is simply just building a relationship with the people that you're offering a service to. So if you're the test supplier um, to an organization, identifying the key stakeholders using maybe a similar technique to here, but then building a relationship with you, with them, where they actually trust you, that's really important. So if they trust you, and maybe if they even like you a little bit, because that's part of consulting, is being likable and people wanting to talk to you and have them have you around to help solve their ideas and their problems. And that goes a long way. So that's more about relationship building between the two companies. And it can go wrong. And when it does, it's a lot of effort to bring it back. Uh, because at that point, it's not, it's not only you they perhaps don't trust and don't think are credible and are not a team player, but they actually think the company you work for is the same. So it needs help from the company that you're at. You probably want to reach out and get support from your teammates. It's a waffly answer. I'm not sure it's very helpful, but it's an answer. No problem. Any other questions or anything else people are struggling with when looking to persuade other people? It's all very quiet. Come on, going, going, gone. Otherwise, we're all going to go get some food, or well, at least some of us. <laughs> okay, cool. Looks like we're done. All right. Um, thanks, Thomas, um, for being here and sharing your uh, ideas and your thoughts and uh, your knowledge. So um, I will share my screen again. <clears throat> okay, let's see where it is. Where is my screen? What I wanted to share. Here we are. Okay. Um, uh, is it the right screen? No, sorry. That's what I meant with be, please be patient. <laughs> okay. Do you see my screen? Something is wrong here, mm. I guess. Now, oh, so, oh, oh. right. Good. Um. All right, so um, Thomas, of course, you are always welcome um, if you have more topics you want uh, to talk about. Um, it was really interesting. Um, so just uh, approach us and um, yeah, like I said, you are always welcome. Thank you. Um, so what's next? Um, the video recording will be available. I give my best um, until the end of the week uh, at latest uh on uh, our website uh continuous testing and uh testing meetup.com and um yeah what's next so uh the next meetup will uh take place in april uh the 19th and uh we will have uh Ilya Volkov here and he will uh hopefully uh, answer the question do customers define quality also very uh, interesting. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you there. And um, yeah, what's left is uh, to wish you all a really nice evening and uh, hope to see you in the next uh, meetup and say bye-bye. Thank you for being Thanks, everyone. Here. Thank you, Gern. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas. Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Bye.